Yeah, so that's kind of what we'll be talking about today. One of the things that we built at Idibon, it's called IdiML. So I purposely chose a generic title using Spark for MLlib. So what exactly are we here to talk about? We are here to talk about the construction of predictive models trained on features extracted from raw text. What exactly does that mean? That's kind of a mouthful. Essentially what we're gonna be doing is turning text into numbers, doing some math on that text, and doing some math on those numbers, and then turning it back into text. Why would we go through that process? It sounds a bit tedious. What does that actually buy us? What's the point? Well, there's a few things, mainly time. We want to save time, and we also want to be able to look at things that haven't necessarily happened yet, so having a peek into the future. Now, a couple of things that could save us time are, let's say we have, if, if anyone was here at last year's Text by the Bay, there was a talk by Rob Monroe and John Ackward, and they talked about doing some classification for Edmunds. They received, Edmunds.com receives PDFs from car manufacturers, and they were able to read that PDF, extract, extract components of that, and put it into the right form, the right column in a database. That saves a lot of human time from reading a PDF and putting things into a structured format. If anyone has used an IVR system, if anyone has made a phone call and been really frustrated by the person not being able to understand you, speech recognition, that needs NLP as well. So NLP can really, it, the, the timing is very important in those systems. Let's say your house is on fire, you don't have time for an IVR system that doesn't recognize your voice. Um, SMS prioritization, that's something that we've done for UNICEF. They receive a lot of text messages from their community, and they have a very limited number of staff to respond to that. So NLP helps them prioritize those messages and bubble the most important ones to the top so that they're not wasting their time. Uh, multilingual news can help us understand where companies are, can help us understand what's going on in the world. If you have a brand or a vertical that you're interested in, there's no way to read all of the news that's coming out about that topic. So NLP can help us there. If you are a video game company who puts out code releases every two weeks, your players might be sitting on a Reddit forum talking all about what's broken or what they really like about the new characters that just showed up. You probably want to know about that. NLP can help us there as well. It's also possible to find a correlation between what people are saying and their intention to buy a product. If you're selling anything, it can be very helpful to predict the demand for your product. This is where NLP can help us. So in order to do all of these things, we need one really important piece, and that is a prediction. Prediction is really the heart and soul of this. That's the entire point, and that's what we're looking for. The prediction is really important because if you aren't using the actual data that you want information about, you could be flying blind, you could be listening to your gut, you could be making decisions based on something that's not even real. You could be completely guessing. So how do we get to that prediction and how do we get a really good prediction? Well, this is where the math comes in. What we need is a recipe or a formula, something that can help us find a prediction that makes sense with high confidence. I won't go through this math, but this is an equation, this is a logistic regression function, and the top one you can see there are a couple coefficients, we're looking for that A and that B, and th those are all the same equation, we're looking for that P, that P is our prediction. So obviously we're not gonna be computing that ourselves, that's where MLlib comes into the picture. MLlib will do all of that number crunching for us, and all we have to do is give it some training data. What is training data? Training data is what MLlib uses to find out those coefficients to build a model that is representative of our data set. Well, there are different ways that you could generate that training data. I won't go into that too much now, but essentially training data is just an answer key. It's a, it's a bunch of documents in the domain that you're looking to make predictions on along with a label. So whatever question you're trying to answer, whatever that prediction needs to be, you label your documents according to what that should be. So you send MLlib your answer key, and so you annotate all these documents, you tell it what you want that, what kind of prediction you want to see at the end, and, oh, 
not yet. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that model is what, it'll build a model for you, and that is what you'll use to generate your prediction. So you get all of your annotations, you get all your documents together, you get all your labels, and you send it to MLlib. And what does it do? It barfs, because it doesn't know how to understand languages. What MLlib is looking for is a vector of doubles. So how do you get that, how do you turn that text into a feature vector? How do you turn it from text into numbers? Now this is the featureization component, and that is where IDML comes into play. This is something that we spent a few months building, and we knew that we wanted to use Spark. We knew that MLlib had some really useful functionality and that it was really fast, but we also needed the featureization component. So we needed a platform that helped us operationalize that process. So it was really flexible and could allow us to implement our own features, use pretty standard ones, and provide, provide a, a persistence layer to do all of this in a scalable environment so that we could support continuous streaming predictions. So what is IDML? Its main function is to perform the three core pieces that, that any NLP system needs to have. That's feature extraction, model training, and prediction. And we've already talked about these. So feature extraction is when you translate, you transform your piece of text into a vector of doubles. That goes into your training algorithm, which is where you apply a label, you give it the answer key, and it generates a model that you can then use to predict on new text that you haven't used in your training set. So in a bit more detail, Featureization pipelines can be incredibly complicated. There can be a lot of different steps. This is a really simple one. Normally, I would do something a bit more complex. Um, but essentially, you are taking your piece of text that may be something with a lot of metadata. maybe a JSON object with author information, location information, time, all of that. Usually, what we care about is the, the content field itself. We may use those other fields as well, but usually we want to just extract the content. And the first thing we want to do with that is split it up into its component parts. So that's the tokenization piece. In English, it's really simple. It's generally just white space and punctuation. But in languages like Japanese and Chinese, it, or in Chinese in particular, it can be very difficult. And that segmentation piece is a very difficult challenge in and of itself. So after you tokenize everything, that's where you can turn it into an n-gram. You may be just looking at unigrams, bigrams, trigrams, all any combination of those. You put that together, you add that to your feature vector, and then that's still in the form of text. That's where you do a lookup and you turn that into a number. And that could, uh, that could have meaning. It could just be an arbitrary index number. Um, but that's kind of less important. But that's where you actually do the transformation from text to a number. And what you get at the end is your feature vector. And that is representative of your entire training set. That is, well, there's one for every, for every document in your set. And that's what the training function uses. Uh, the, that's what training uses to come up with the coefficients for the logistic regression model. So that's the model training piece. That's where we take that featureization vector that, that large group of featureization vectors, and we add our label to it. This is the annotation that we've collected earlier in the process. And we turn that into a number as well. We put that into a labeled point object. If you've used Spark, you're probably familiar with that. And, and also the, the vector object, that refers to MLlib's vector object, not just a standard Scala object or anything. Um, so we get all of that training data together, and we send that into our logistic regression function. And Spark performs all those calculations for us. It calculates that coefficient, and it builds a model. And that model is what we later use to spit out a prediction on another piece of text. So we may use that right away, or we may put it into some sort of storage layer and recall it later, depending on what we're doing with it. But once we have that model, that means that we can make predictions on anything else in the domain. We want to keep that in the same domain as the original text that we use for trading. So when we get a new piece of text, that's where we'll first run that piece of text through the exact same featureization pipeline that we used before. 
to get our futurization, our feature vector. And when we have that, we go, we grab the model that we built, and we send it in. We ask it for a prediction. MLib handles all of that. It just takes our feature vector as an input and gives us a number at the end, gives us a prediction. And that's where we go back when we transformed that, that label into a number. We do a lookup to find out what that prediction is, and we send the piece of text back to the person who asked for it. So those three components, the featureization, model training, and prediction, those are really the, the core features of IDML. But really, what's the point? A lot of libraries do those three things, and we could do that in a lot of ways. So why do we even need IDML if that's all that we're doing? Well, the point is it helps us operationalize it. So if that's all we were doing on a local machine and we wanted to just make simple predictions for ourselves, that would be fine. We wouldn't need an entire persistence layer to do that. But the reason we built IDML, the reason we needed it, is because we, were, we had thousands of models for all different customers. And if you're maintaining that many models, you really need a simpler way to maintain that. Because your ops team, I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense to, to do it manually. So you want something that can automate that layer. So one of the first things that, one of the biggest advantages is just that it puts everything into a single object. Everything you need for retrieving that prediction is all contained within just a simple jar file. That means that's all of your, that's the index that you use for turning the, the text into a double. That's all of the, that's your featureization pipeline so that you know you can apply the same featureization pipeline to your new piece of text as you did to all of your training items. Um, and that means that you can store everything, you can put everything into a storage layer, and when you go to recall it at prediction time, if you have to rebuild anything, you can retrain models, you can do everything over again from just that one object. You don't need to store things in different tables, in different locations, everything is all right there. Sorry, I just... Um, the other, the other advantage to that is that it adds a lot of flexibility. And by flexibility, I mean in terms of, uh, that, that has a couple, a couple of aspects. Your deployment environment. Right now, I think we were, we were using Docker containers deploying on AWS images. But if, I don't know, let's say the business relationship with Amazon goes south or they kill one of the services that we were depending on, we could very easily, because this was all self-contained and, and a separate module, um, and it was separate from our deployment platform, we could very easily move to a different cloud provider or do something else entirely, use Lambda or something else. Um, this is also in terms of the device. The IDML supports generic input streams and output streams, which means that we're not even really dependent on having to write to disk. So you could do this on a very lightweight piece of hardware somewhere, um, or you could do this really anywhere you wanted. And also the logging framework is pretty important. That insulates us from, uh, Spark is very reliant on log4j, but IDML uses self4j, so it supports a lot of underlying log frameworks, but gives us sort of one interface for integrating into a different application. So a lot of flexibility. Also, in terms of flexibility, what it allows you to do is use not just MLlib, but any other library, any other machine learning library that may come along. Let's say MLlib dies in a year, people just stop using it, decide it's not great, or just migrate to something else. We would easily be able to add you know, the new flavor of the week in without sort of affecting any of our feature engineers that are used to writing features in this IDML framework. It also means that we can take some of the custom machine learning functions that we had before we started using Spark, and we can plug those in easily as well. And using the same featureization pipeline, we can sort of select those um, as, a, as a developer, as someone building these models. I could select any combination of those and combine them and run them in different ways. So it insulates both your developers and it also gives you a few more options for combining things. So the REST API is separate. That, 
that's an example of something that would use ADML. So ADML is, is really just those core machine learning components, and it's, it's built to plug into any other type of system. It's very standalone. You would just call, um, call that the ADML jar file with whatever information you needed from your larger application. I see the value of having a structured process right there. Mm -hmm. Does it support that, or it's more for We will talk about that. That is an excellent question. And that's, that's exactly why we did it. So hyperparameterization, we want to be able to automate as much of that as possible. And the more options you have, uh, the better. As long as you have enough computing power to support it all, you really just need to add compute power, and it, it's just like if anyone's familiar with the cross-validation function in Spark, it's very similar to that, but it sort of, it's one level above. So it's incorporating that feature pipeline and maybe other machine learning libraries as well. But then uh, for every um, you know, algorithm you need to build a separate library, mm -hmm. uh, parame parameterization is one part, but the mm -hmm. library itself is a second part, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to create multiple groups of procedures, mm -hmm. uh, one will be, uh, or each group will be like a, uh, a classification model, mm -hmm. you know, like if you topic model, if you take LDA, maybe LDA with different parameters in one group, and then, you know, subsequently you can <coughs> do other uh, naive page classification, mm -hmm. whatever. Is that, is that something supported by this model? Absolutely, that's a very good point. And, and the question was, you may have different implementations of logistic regression, and those are sort of one group, or different implementations of, of classification in general, um, binary classification or multi-class. And then you may have some that do clustering. There's maybe some LDA and, and something else in there. And so the way that we've implemented it is to, to have inheritance. And what you, what you do when you generate the feature pipeline is you would specify that it has to be a, a classification, a, a K a multi-class or a binary classification, and then we would, when we implemented a new library, we would inherit from that superclass. And, and that's a very good point, because that means that you can be a lot more flexible, and, and that's really the only way to, to support a lot of those, um, to parameterize the whole pipeline so that you can swap in and out. That's a very good point. So another thing that it, that's really important if you're working in an enterprise environment is you need to be able to roll back your versions. We talked about having, so models get stale. When we're talking about text data, languages change very frequently and you need to keep them up to date. So we, we, use, the, we use something that we call continuous training and what that refers to is anytime there's new data entering into the system, whether that be new annotations coming in, so new training data, or perhaps some model parameters have changed. Anytime any of those specifications change, we would regenerate the model. And if you automate that, it means you can kind of set it and forget it. You don't have to worry about your model too much, especially if you're using automated hyperparameter tuning because it will check the accuracy and it can adjust parameters accordingly. But let's say you add some data into the system. Um, maybe our friend here has entered in some annotations that were a bit funny. Maybe his definition of intent to purchase is different from someone else's, who knows. But let's say that the model that gets trained is, is actually less accurate. It's, it's not what we were expecting at all. It would, it, IDML allows us the, the capability to roll back very quickly, to, to call up the the models that we generated the day before, or the week before, or the year before. And I talked about having that single object. That's how we do it. Because we're storing those objects and assigning a version number, it's really easy to recall that single object and replace it with the one that we don't want. But version control also refers to not just the model itself and the parameters that go along with that model, but also the code that we use to generate that model. That object, that, that jar file. And we refer to that as an alloy. I should probably use the name. Um, an alloy just encompasses all of, all of those parameters. If you, 
if you write a featureization pipeline and and let's say it's using um, Spark's logistic regression with LBFGS. So that's one way of implementing, but then a month later we find another implementation that's, that gives us much better accuracies and we want to replace things. So maybe we make the decision to, to make that the default instead. Well, the feature pipeline doesn't really know about that because of, because of the abstraction. So we include a version number in the feature pipeline and that helps us determine which code to actually run. Because a feature pipeline is really just a JSON file that defines a class name. And that class name might be um, a few layers above the actual implementation of the actual algorithm that we want to run. So that version number will help us decide, OK, in version one, we were using this as a default. In version two, we were using this as a default. And th the cool thing about specifying it as a JSON, uh, one of our coworkers, Gary, wrote this part. It was really cool. It takes that class name and, and reifies the object, and that's how it builds the actual bytecode to, to execute. So it's really neat the way you can specify the, how the model gets trained. So versioning is really important, especially for enterprise customers. They get really, really upset when you touch things, even if it doesn't influence anything. And God forbid, if it does influence anything, you better be able to roll back to the version that they like. So this is kind of what we were talking about before. Um, this gentleman had a question about being able to sort of pick and choose different components within your system. We want to parameterize as much as possible and give ourselves the opportunity to try out a lot of different combinations of those parameters. Because that can have a significant effect on the accuracy of the underlying prediction. So hyperparameter tuning refers to some of the parameters that you might send in to Spark's logistic regression function. So uh, some numerical parameters that affect those, how those coefficients are discovered. Or it could also refer to different feature pipelines. Um, so you may have a few that you really like that are pretty general purpose that, that give, have given you good results on other models. And you want to try those out. You're not really sure which one would work best with this one. So you would supply in your JSON not just one feature pipeline, but several. And ADML supports cycling through all of those and also using Spark's own cross-validation feature, which cycles through the Spark-specific parameters, the algorithm-specific ones. And what you get at the end is a model that, based on your cross-validation results, you expect to be much more accurate. Uh, the flip side of that is that you need to be really confident in your training data because you don't want to overfit your models. This is cross-validation, so you can't, I mean, it's training data, test data, there's a difference. But it will at least get you pretty far, and um, it automates as much of that as possible so that you don't, as a data scientist, have to build models over and over again, supplying different parameters each time. That gets really tedious. <laughs> So let's talk about performance. One of the really big advantages, at least for us, compared to our old system, and, and we built this because we needed something that was, we needed something that would give us thousands of predictions per second that we could scale up easily. And we had that before, but it took a lot of compute power. So when we, were fir when we first started building this, we knew that we wanted Spark to be a part of it somehow, but we weren't exactly sure what that would look like. So we compared, we looked at data frames, because data frames, you know, it's the new hotness. I guess not anymore, but at the time, it was the new hotness. And a lot of people were encouraging us to use I mean, it, it has a lot of extra functionality. Data frames are really great. And I was sort of used to using data frames in a batch processing environment, and they make perfect sense there. but. Our use case was really to take these really small documents and return individual predictions as quickly as possible. And the timings between those two, between the underlying, just the, the core vector object and the data frame, it was significantly different. So to a data frame is, is built on top of a vector. A vector underlies it. And so there's a lot of extra things that are going on in order to use that data frame. So in, so uh, one prediction using a data frame took us um, took us 7,800 microseconds, which was so almost eight milliseconds. Which, if we wanted thousands of predictions per second, was a non-starter for us. It, it just wasn't an option. 
So what we did is we looked at using the vector object instead and sort of skipping like the core Spark framework and going directly to the ML lib functionality. And that got us in the range that we were looking for. That was much quicker. And we ran a couple of benchmarks comparing the two. And it was exactly as we expected, you know, in the, in the smaller batch sizes, which is the case that we're trying to optimize for, there was, it, there was a significant difference. And we saw much, much faster performance with vectors as opposed to data frames. And obviously, the larger your batch sizes, you, the larger your batch sizes are, the less of a difference there is. And, and that's very much in line with the idea behind Spark. It's meant to process large amounts of data very efficiently, and, and it does that. It absolutely does that. But for us, because our use case was more of the single prediction, um, it, it made a lot of sense for us to use a vector. And that did mean that we had to expose a couple of private functions, because MLlib wasn't exactly built with our use case in mind. But we also, you know, we also kind of found a couple of things that we were able to improve and send back into the code base. So it's, I, I think, as long as they don't go in a, a different direction entirely, um, then it makes a lot of sense to use the, the vector instead of the data frame. And this is, this is like how dramatic the difference was for us. So we were using JRuby and some custom libraries that were on top of that. And so you have the, J, you have the Ruby layer, you have the JVM layer. It's a lot more difficult to, to run those basic, those core algorithmic functions with, with all of that. So with our old code base, we had like two dozen servers to, to do you know, a, a pretty hefty volume of predictions, but that same volume of predictions, which was roughly equivalent to the size of the Twitter firehose in terms of word count, um, we did all of that on, it wasn't this laptop, but it was a MacBook Pro from like last year. I mean, a, not even a brand new laptop, just consumer grade, nothing, nothing fancy, and it didn't even come close to tapping out the CPU. So it made a huge difference for us. An email was uh, kind of a game changer and yeah, performance was, was a big deal. So what else do we want to do? There are a couple of things. We need, to, we need to generalize it. So there are, there are specific touch points that were, there are a number of touch points that were very specific to uh, the larger platform, to that REST API that was calling this. And that could use a bit of generalization. It is standalone, but it ha makes some assumptions about the way the annotations look, the way that training data looks whenever you import it into it. So that could be a bit more generic. Uh, we also want to add some statistical models. Right now, we're using binary and multi-class classification, but we want to add a lot more to that. Random forests, um, there's, I think we have some clustering in there right now, but we want to add different types of clustering. We really want to expand the choices that we have during our hyperparameter tuning. We also want to support it across the entire pipeline. So, so instead of specifying three different pipelines in the JSON, we really just want to specify like a bag of features and have it generate different combinations of those features into individual pipelines and then compare that with the, uh, with the parameters we're providing to the logistic regression function. And that just gives us a, a, it, that gives us a bit more flexibility in the combinations of parameters that we can use. And then also adding more features to it. Um, one that I was working on this weekend was uh, Chinese segmentation because I came across a paper that uh, described a really, a really interesting approach. And that's instead of, for Chinese segmentation, you, you normally would look at a lexicon and look at you know, the, the makeup of certain characters. Statistically, that forms a word. But instead of doing it that way, it's looking at the, the boundaries between the words and essentially using a classifier rather than taking the lexicon-based approach. So even just trying out new things that come out in academia, you want to be able to easily create features to test that, and that's what IDML is really good about, uh, really good with. So essentially, it's a really flexible framework. It's a lot faster than a, a fast framework that we were using before, um, so it, which means that it can support the goal of providing continuous stream processing at really high volumes. And it's language independent, so you do you might need some language specific features, but again, those are fairly simple to implement. And I really like using Spark and MLlib. It we started there, um, and we saw some great performance. I really love Scala as well. That was kind of an added bonus. So it is in Scala, and 
yeah, it's a fantastic framework. So if anyone wants me to clarify or go into a bit more detail, um, I'll open the floor up to questions. Go ahead. So I think you may have touched on this a little bit, but um, do you have anything to help kind of automate um, the feature selection phase? So if you're computing bigrams and trigrams, mm -hmm. you know, you compute a whole ton mm -hmm. of bigrams and trigrams, and most of them were only seen once or twice, and mm -hmm. you want to throw those out. And you, mm -hmm. There's still this, like, stage of black magic where you, you know, figure out which features are actually the predictive ones so that you don't overfit. Um, yeah, so the question is whether we have anything that automatically selects features that are important. Or at least helps to streamline that part of the process, right? Because that's still a pain point. Yes. So that does happen automatically. You, that's, that's sort of built into the code. And I think the way we handle that is once we build those bigrams, trigrams, we, we just have like a cutoff value. So anything, anything lower than that, it's, you know, it's not too sophisticated. It doesn't right. employ any sort of algorithm in that process. Um, but we've seen pretty great results with that in the past. And um, I mean, that's, that's always an extension that, that could fairly simply be added. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, so it uses Spark under the hood. Like Spark is a dependency, and it just pulls that in. Um, it uses Gradle as a build tool. It pulls in that dependency and just calls the libraries. So instead of Spark, can we use some other, mm -hmm. maybe like ThinkML or probably R or something like that? Yes. Like that to make it yeah, so as long, uh, the question is, instead of Spark, could we use other libraries? And that's kind of the point. We want to bring in as as much flexibility as possible, bring in as many as possible to compare them, to, to really be able to compare apples to apples. And as long as it's supported on the JVM, we can pull it in because it's Scala. Yeah, sorry. So, so this was before we were using ADML, and we needed like dozens of serv servers to to have enough computing power. This was on our JRuby framework with our sort of custom platform, and then once we added ADML, we were doing essentially the same process, the same type of prediction on the exact same data set, and we could do that on a single laptop, like not even distributed, just on a consumer grade laptop, and run the exact same volumes of data through and get the same predictions. Yeah, so, so we started with Spark. MLlib was the first, the, their logistic regression function was the first thing we used. So we were using a logistic regression function um, from within JRuby and, and then Spark's version of that. But we weren't using the distributed, that was literally just running Spark locally on that computer. Yeah, we were accessing the, the Spark function. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Thank you.